In this lesson, we're going to dig a little bit deeper about how to find multiplicative inverses in a more efficient way than what we saw in the last lesson. So computing greatest common divisors and multiplicative inverses isn't really that hard from a mathematical point of view, but it does require factoring numbers down, which takes a long time. And this is the first time we're encountering that in this course, but it is a big idea in modern cryptography. So we'll see it time and time again throughout the course. Factoring is a slow process. And it only gets slower as numbers get bigger and bigger. So if a number is twice as large, it might actually take more than twice the time to factor that new number. Luckily, there's some nice mathematics that have made factoring a little bit faster than it would be otherwise. And this, this is a piece of mathematics that comes from Euclid. Euclid that you maybe have heard about in a geometry class, more specifically Euclid, Euclid of Alexandria, who helped develop the Euclidean algorithm, or as maybe better put, is known for the Euclidean algorithm. It appeared in his book called Euclid's Elements back around 300 BC, um, and it can really efficiently compute the greatest common divisor of two numbers, which we'll see is really going to be helpful for our work. In fact, it, this algorithm was probably not developed by Euclid. He was pretty, pretty well known for often just compiling work by other mathematicians that came before him. And since then, this algorithm was discovered independently from his work in both India and China, uh, although it might have happened to be a century or two later. Um, it's a little bit of a falsehood to say uh, this algorithm truly belongs to Euclid. But what is important is that we know it's been around for over 2000 years, and it's still got some great uses today. So let's see this algorithm in action. And then we'll dig into why it works. So suppose you've got two numbers, A, which is 707, and B, which is 980, and you're interested in finding the greatest common divisor of those two numbers. Well, what the Euclidean algorithm claims is that instead of solving the original problem, which would involve factoring 707, factoring 980, and looking for all of the common factors to build up that common divisor, the biggest one, we could instead simplify the problem by instead finding the greatest common divisor of 707, the first number, and 980 minus 707, the difference between them. Notice we just subtract the smaller from the biggest, but mathematically this would work either way, but this will get us to our result much faster. So now our problem is to find the greatest common divisor of 707 and 273. Smaller numbers, smaller numbers are easier to factor, faster to factor. But why stop at this once? If that rule is true, and we've not proven that it is yet, why would we sell ourselves short? We should do the same trick again. Let's take that 273 and subtract it from 707 and now find the greatest common divisor between 434 and 273. Ah, oh, even smaller numbers. But why stop now? Go again. And instead, we can find the greatest common divisor between 161 and 273. And we can go back and forth like this, subtracting the smaller number from the largest number until eventually we get down to either these two numbers are the same in which case we can pretty easily inspect that the greatest common divisor of 7 and 7 is itself 7. Or if you went one step further, maybe you didn't catch that, one of your two terms would be 0, by which case you know the other number must be the greatest common divisor. So it turns out this is much faster than factoring 707 and 980 down to its component primes, grouping them up to get the greatest common divisor, because this is just a bunch of simple subtractions, which for both a human and a computer are very easy to do. There's really not a lot of thinking that goes on, just a process that you can follow. So they're much quicker to do. Let's figure out why this works. This all hinges on the fact that Euclid poses that instead of finding the greatest common divisor of the two numbers as they are, that instead you can find the greatest common divisor of the smaller number and then the difference between the bigger and the smaller number, and you'll get the same answer. It turns out you can check that it is true. 7 is the greatest common divisor of 707 and 980, but let's find out why. So let's talk about why the Euclidean algorithm works. Let's start by supposing we have some number n that we define to be the product of d and x. We have a second number m, which we define to be the product of d and y where d, x, and y are all positive integers, and then therefore n and m are also product integers, positive integers. Notice that d will divide both the numbers n and m because they both, n and m, have d as a factor. And that's how we define divisibility when we were talking about numbers. That if a number has a second number as one of its factors, that second number divides the first number. So d divides n, 
d divides m because d is a factor of both of those numbers. And then one notational note, we're going to start using this notation, uh, this vertical line that separates the two numbers, d and n, as shorthand for saying d divides n. So we'll start seeing that on the next slide, just wanted to prepare you. So one fact that'll be helpful for us to explain why the Euclidean algorithm works the way it does is that if we were to take the difference between those two numbers, m and n, so substituting dy for m and dx for n, we could factor the d out and we're left with the product of d and y minus x, which means that d is a factor of n minus n because it's a, a product with another integer, which means that by our definition of divisibility, d is a number that will also divide the difference between m and n. So that might make sense, but might not seem very useful yet, but that'll be a very important fact for where we're going next. So let's dig in and see why this Euclidean algorithm must work all of the time. We'll start by defining two things, that d is the greatest common divisor of x and y, and that d prime is the greatest common divider of x in the difference between y and x. Our goal is to prove that those two numbers are actually the same, and if that's true, well then what Euclid showed us, the algorithm we saw previously, must always work. It wasn't just a fluke. Here's how we're going to prove it. It's going to hinge on these two statements here, which maybe seem obvious, but let's reiterate one more time. If D is the greatest common divisor of X and Y, it is the largest divisor of X and Y. If D prime is the greatest common divisor of X and Y minus X, D prime is the largest divisor of those two numbers. There could be other divisors, but if there are, they must be smaller. So let's, let's use this all to our advantage here. Since D is the greatest common divisor of X and Y, D must divide both X and Y. And as we just saw on the previous slide, that means d must also divide the difference between y and x. So we currently know that d is a divisor of both x and y minus x. Well, we already know that d prime also is a divisor of x and y minus x, but d prime must be the largest divisor of those two numbers. That's why it's the greatest common divisor. So it's all great that D divides both of them too, but it just means that D must be smaller than D prime. Hold on to that thought. Let's work that same kind of logic on the second statement. Let's look at D prime. D prime divides X. D prime divides the difference between Y and X. And with a little bit of reasoning, very similar to what we just saw on the last page, that if we were to add X and Y minus X together, we could figure out that D prime also divides Y. So if D prime divides X and Y, just like D does, well, that just means D prime is a divisor of X and Y, but it can't be the biggest common divisor between X and Y. That, that prize is already taken by D. So good job, D prime. You divide both of them, you, but you just got to be a smaller than number than D. But let's look at these two statements we have. How could D both be less than or equal to D prime, but D prime be less than or equal to D? It must mean that the less than part really isn't the important part there. It must mean that those two things are equal. The only way to make both those inequalities that we have proven to be true, true simultaneously, is if the value for D and D prime are in fact the same. And that's it. We've proven it. We have proven that the greatest common divisor between X and Y and the greatest common divisor between X and Y minus X must be the same number. So now we can use the Euclidean algorithm to find greatest common divisors without fear that it's ever going to go haywire and not give us a correct result. We've proven it to be true all of the time. So let's see how we can maybe apply this Euclidean algorithm in a more general sense, which might help us think about how we could program the Euclidean algorithm using Python. So instead of choosing specific values for a and b, let's keep them general and just say they're integers. And our goal now is going to find the greatest common divisor of a and b, which now we know we can just do the greatest common divisor of a and b minus a. So in Python, what we might choose to do is redefine b to be b minus a, so then we can just say, well, I'm going to find the greatest common divisor of A and this new value of B, which we'll find some way to do in code and just say, let's subtract the smaller number A from the bigger number B. 
and we'll do that for a while. We can repeat this step. Let's always subtract the smaller number of the two from the bigger one. Maybe sometimes that means we're going to have to redefine A, because if we do enough subtractions off of B, maybe B is now, in fact, the smaller one. So we'll need to subtract B from A and then redefine A and do it again and again and again until A and B end up being the exact same values, A is equal to B. And when that's true, since they're the same, we can just look at whatever A or B is, in this case I've, I've chosen A, to figure out our greatest common divisor. So that is going to be our strategy here. We're going to compare A and B, subtract the smaller one from the bigger one, and redefine it to where the bigger one used to be, and then check again. Which one's bigger? Subtract the small one from the big one, redefine that difference to be where the big one used to be, and we're going to keep going and going and going, repeating, repeating, repeating. Sounds like a good case for a loop. We don't know how many times that we're going to have to do this, so it sounds like a good case to use a while loop. And we're going to keep doing this process until we find that A is equal to B. So as long as A and B are different numbers, we're going to repeat these operations. Let's take those ideas and turn them into some code. So I've chosen two numbers, A and B, to be 2 and 26. And remember, we want to subtract the smaller one from the bigger one until those two numbers are the same. So to get us started, we'll get the header of our while loop here. So we'll say while does A does not equal B. So basically, if A and B are equal, we should stop. But if they're not equal, we should do what's in the loop. Now, what did we say we want to do? We want to subtract the small one from the big one, but we don't know which one of those is right away. We have to do some sort of comparison. So we can say if A is bigger than B, then subtract B from A and then redefine that to be the new value of A. Else, and this is a new Python command for us today, we haven't seen this, else subtract A from B and redefine that to B. What the else statement does is that if your if statement ends up being false, you can give it a secondary line of code to run when that's the condition. So in this case, if A is bigger, subtract B from A, otherwise subtract A from B, and then it's gonna go back up to the top of the loop and it's gonna keep going, 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 until A and B ultimately end up being equal to each other, which means the loop will stop and it will show us the value of A, which is 2, which we know is the greatest common divisor of 2 and 26. Let's real quick look at the visualization of this in code. And notice it's only going to take 40 steps for it to do it, which sounds like a lot, but for a computer it goes really quickly. All right, let's take a look at this code run. So we'll step through and define our values for A and B to be 2 and 26, and we jump into the loop. So it's going to compare those two. And as long as they're not equal, which they are not, it will run the code. So it's going to go to this if statement next and see if A is bigger than B. Mm, that's not true. So we're going to hop over line 5, and we're going to go to the content of the else, loop in, or the else statement instead. So it's going to do B minus A and store that back to B. So we should see B decrease by 2 when we line, run that next line of code. And it does. And it goes back up to the top of the loop and checks, are they equal yet? Nope, they're not. So we're going to keep on going. Is A bigger than B? Nope. Go to the else statement. And this is going to go on for a while. So we're going to keep stepping through this code. We can see B continuing to be incrementing lower and lower until eventually it hits 2. And now when we get to this while loop, it says while A is not equal to B, but they are equal, this is no longer a true statement. So we get out of the loop and we run the final line of code, line 9, which will print to the screen our greatest common divisor. Let's take another look with slightly different numbers to see how it affects the runtime. So we can see here that A is a slightly bigger number now, 7. All the rest of the code is exactly the same. And as we step through, we can see the same thing start at first. And if we increment until B is now smaller than A, and now when we go to the next step, the if statement resolves to be true. So we're going to run line 5. So we're going to subtract B from A. And now A is the smaller one. So we're going to run the else statement. And now A is still smaller. We'll run the else statement once more. B is now smaller. We'll run it again. And now the two are equal. And it turns out we jump out of our loop. And our greatest common divisor is 1, which is true. Since A is prime, the biggest divisor it must have with 26 is 1, since B uh, equals 26, does not have 7 as a factor.
That only took 25 steps, even shorter. So certain conditions for A and B will cause us to run faster or slower, but we'll see it's not that many steps for the computer to do to get a greatest common divisor. That's the beauty of this algorithm. It operates very efficiently. We can see here that if we redo the example of 707 and 980 and find their greatest common divisor of 7, it only took 37 steps. It's actually less than 2 and 26 in order for the computer to do it. And if you put in really big numbers, so 765,873 and 3,945,934, it only takes the computer 148 steps in order to do that to find that those two are actually relatively prime. They share no factors besides one. We'll continue to work with this algorithm throughout the course, and these numbers will only get larger and larger as we do it. It turns out there's even a slightly more efficient way in the computer for us to do this. This is the way Euclid envisioned this algorithm, but we've been able to update it with modern times and operations that maybe Euclid was not quite aware of at the moment. So we can do a little bit better, but we'll save that for another lesson. It turns out there's an extension to this algorithm. We could even do better than just finding the greatest common divisor. If we just keep track, we do a little bookkeeping as we work through our algorithm, we can actually figure out not only what the greatest common divisor is, but if that greatest common divisor is one, we can actually find the multiplicative inverse, which is really why we care about this in this course, is that we're trying to find multiplicative inverses for our uh, various sized alphabets. So what this extended Euclidean algorithm allows you to do is solve equations very efficiently that are in the form. The greatest common divisor between two numbers equals the first number times x plus the, B, plus the second number b times y. So we're going to look for x's and y's that solve this equation, and we'll see why that's important to us to finding multiplicative inverses in just a moment. When we can find that the greatest common divisor between our two numbers is 1, and once you know x and y, you can mod by A or B in order to get the following equations, or maybe more specifically, the following equivalencies. You can see that 1 is going to be congruent to BY mod A, because if I mod by A, if you look at our equation, well, they read in the middle of the screen, it says BY plus some multiple of A. So if I mod by A, the AX part is equivalent to a 0. It's just we're adding on some multiple of A, some multiple of our modulus, so it actually doesn't impact our congruence statement. Likewise, if we were to mod by b and get a congruent statement here, well, we're just left with ax because the original equation was ax plus by, some multiple of b. So if we mod by b, those multiples are equivalent to adding zero once we get it down to our congruent statement. Why is that important? Well, if we know that two numbers are congruent to one in a particular modulus, then we know those two numbers are actually inverses of each other, multiplicative inverses of each other, which is what we're trying to do find the multiplicative inverse in a particular modulus. Let's see how this all works out. Say we want to find the multiplicative inverse of 7 in mod 26. You might remember from a previous lesson what that is, but I'm not going to tell you. See if you remember. And then we're going to go ahead and figure it out. Our goal is to obtain some equation in the form of the greatest common divisor of a and b, such that it's equal to ax plus by. So for these specific numbers, the greatest common divisor of 7 and 26, we know is 1. We just saw it. And we're looking for that 1 to be equal to 7x plus 26y. So a, in this case, is our 7, our key. And 26 is our m, or our modulus, or the size of our alphabet. So this is the goal. We want to get our equation to look like this, so we can figure out what x and y are. And then once we get it into this form, we'll be able to find our inverse. Let's get to work. So to get there, we have to start with these equations. And they're going to seem pretty obvious and maybe not very useful at first, but trust me, we're going to put them to good use in just a moment. Equation 1 is just specifying that 26 is equal to 7 times 0 plus 26 times 1. The second equation is that 7 is equal to 7 times 1 plus 26 times 0. While these aren't inherently helpful quite yet, they are somewhat in the form of what we're trying to get to. A number on the left is equal to 7 times a multiple plus 26 times a multiple. And we're going to keep rearranging this pair of equations and try and work our way to that equation form that we're hoping for, which is a 1 on the left, 7 times a number, plus 26 times a number on the right. And we can do that by subtracting off multiples of equation 2 from equation 1. This is just like our Euclidean algorithm we saw earlier. 
So I could subtract off seven from 26, but I, I can see I could probably do that a few times. I'm gonna speed it up. I'm gonna subtract off three times the second equation from the first equation. So three times seven is 21. 21 subtracted from 26 gives me the five on the left-hand side of the equation and our third equation down here at the bottom. Seven times zero, subtracting off three times seven times one, is gonna give me seven times negative three. And I'm gonna keep it in that form. I know that's the same thing as negative 21, but I'm gonna keep it in this form to help keep track of how many multiples of seven there are since that's the form of our goal equation. And we'll do the same thing with the 26. One times 26 minus three times zero times 26 is still just one times 26 on the right-hand side of the plus sign. So we now have a new equation. The left-hand side is five, it's not one, but five is closer to one than either seven or 26 was. And in fact, let's do the same thing again with these two new equations. We'll, we'll re, rename equation two to re, equation one, and we'll name that new equation we just got to be our new equation two. And you see, we can do the same process again. I could subtract off just equation two from equation one. And when I do that, seven minus five gives me two on the left. Seven times one minus seven times negative three gives me seven times positive four. And then 26 times zero minus 26 times one gives me a plus 26 times negative one. And we can verify this is, this is still correct. Our equation is still true. Two is equal to 28 plus negative 26. And again, uh, it's not exactly the form that I want, but the two on the left is getting me closer to that one equals. So let's do this one more time. Same step, new equations. We can subtract off two multiples of equation two from equation one. So five minus two times two gives me the one on the left. Ooh, that's what we're shooting for. We're getting close now. And on the right-hand side of the equals, if we subtract off seven times negative three, and we subtract from that two times seven times four, we'll get seven times negative 11. And on the right-hand side, same thing with the multiples of 26, we'll obtain 26 times three. And we can verify that this is correct, that the numbers on the right-hand side actually do add up to one. And we're at our goal. We've got our equation into the form that we were hoping for. Now, why was that helpful? We got the solutions. X is negative 11 and Y is 3. Let's use them. So remember, we have 1 is equal to 7 times negative 11 plus 26 times 3. Our goal is to figure out what number 7 could be multiplied by in order for it to equal or be congruent to 1 in mod 26. If we take this equation and mod by 26, that 26 times three is effectively adding by zero. Remember any number that you add multiples of 26 to, in this case, we've added three multiples of 26, are effectively adding by zero after we're done applying the mod operator in a mod of 26. So we're left with the statement that one is congruent to seven times negative 11 in mod 26. So seven and a negative 11 then meet our requirements to be multiplicative inverses. They multiply together to give you a congruency value of one in mod 26. We did it. Now, conventionally, we want our, our inverse keys to be between zero and 25 if we're working in mod 26. So we can just do uh, our mod operator on negative 11 to find out its equivalent is 15 in mod 26. So we would say that seven and 15 are multiplicative inverses in mod 26. And we've now just seen how the extended Euclidean algorithm allows us to quickly compute that. It took a few steps, but we'll see that this is a nice way to do this as the numbers get larger and larger and larger. 26 possible attempts. Yeah, we could write a little loop to brute force this for us. But when our mod is in the hundreds or thousands of digits, we're not going to want to try them all. We won't be able to try them all. But this algorithm will still work relatively efficiently in order to get that same result. We'll learn how to program this algorithm a little bit later on in the course, but for now, we're going to be doing this by hand. So it might be helpful to find a little shorthand so you don't have to keep writing down all of those computations, all of them. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to keep track of, you might have already picked up on this watching the work, all we really need to keep track of are those two numbers that, are the, that re represent the multiples of 26 and 7. So I'm going to create a little table along the right-hand side here as we copy down the equations that we produced on the previous couple of the slides. So, so far I've got this first equation, 26, and it has one multiple of 26 and zero multiples of seven in order to produce that total of 26. The second equation we had was seven was equal to 26 times zero plus seven times one. So I've marked those uh, coefficients to 26 and seven as zero and one on the table on the right-hand side. Then we had five was equal to 26 times one plus seven times negative three. 
So I've written the 5 down the left-hand column and then the 1 in the negative 3 to keep track of the multiples of 26 and 7 that are indicated in the two columns. And then 2, negative 1, and 4 become the coefficients in the table for the next equation. And then 1, 3, negative 11 on the uh, last row. And we know that that negative 11, the one under the 7 column, because we modded by 26, that negative 11 is our inverse. And that's how we've got to 15 being our multiplicative inverse. I think that working with these, uh, just these coefficients on the right is going to be a much quicker process for you. We don't really care about the 26 and the 7s in the equations. We just care about the coefficients that come along for the ride. And we can perform that same difference or subtraction between one row and the next without having to write everything down. I think this will really speed it up for you. And that's our Euclidean algorithm. What it is, how to use it, and why it always works. I think you'll find it to be a very efficient way for you to first verify that a particular number has a multiplicative inverse in a particular modulus, and then use the extended version of the algorithm to figure out what that inverse is.